Goldfish? Goths? Grandparents? The Fountain of Youth? Next on the Bedley Brothers. Today with us we have New York Times best-selling author and Newbery honoree Jennifer Holm. She's the author of The Fourteenth Goldfish, which is a super hot book right now in a ton of elementary schools, middle schools around the nation, and we are so privileged to have you on the show with us today. Jennifer, thanks for joining us. No, it's, it's my pleasure completely. It's so cool to be here. Thanks. Hey, uh, first of all, tell me about those cool glasses. Ah, so, uh, <laughs> yes, so I'm, I'm a new, uh, I, I recently moved to Southern California, but I used to live in Northern California, and in the Bay Area, where 14 Goldfish actually takes place, and I, there was this great Chinese eyeglass shop, so I got these there, so they're my, they're my, they're my global eyeglasses. <laughs> and for those of you that are just listening, they're, they're a white kind of uh, frame to them, and I've never seen glasses like that before, and I love uh, novel glasses, so you caught my interest. Hey, so your book uh, is entitled The Fourteenth Goldfish. Are you uh, into goldfish? Is this something that you're interested in? Did you always have goldfish gr growing up, or were you always at that carnival booth trying to win a goldfish for yourself? I, I def yeah, I definitely was the kid at the carnival carnival booth, you know, throwing the ping pong ball into the tiny little bowl and bringing home the fish and having it die like three days later. So we had a we had a lot of fish die in our house and have uh, toilet bowl funerals. <laughs> I'm one of five kids, so that just take me times five, and that's how many fish went through our house. So, <laughs> so, so schools and schools of fish. Yes, I feel sorry for the fish. <laughs> uh, you had to go yeah. somewhere, though. So, and three days might be a little bit longer than most goldfish last, too. So, I know um, exactly. Jennifer, Jennifer, so I I got first exposed to your book from uh, uh, Pernil Rip's fantastic movement of Global Read Aloud, and my class got a chance to have it read aloud to them by another teacher out of county through Google Hangouts like this, and it was a really neat experience for them not only to do that but to follow the tension and excitement through this book. So can you can you talk first, just share a little bit with the audience the overall um, plot line of this story, and then um, a little bit how you work to build that tension in the story. Sure. I mean, so uh, the book is called, I have it right here, The Fourteenth Goldfish. Um, nice cover. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so um, it's basically about uh, a girl who's on the, who's just, entering middle school, and she is 11, and she faces a lot of similar issues. I recall from being in, you know, entering middle school, it's kind of, you know, you're starting over again, you have to make new friends, it's also a time in your life when people start to really find passions, like they might find a sport, or they might get excited about drama club or art, and so groups start to splinter, and um, Ellie, who's the character, she hasn't quite figured out what she wants to be. She's got very uh, two very arty theatrical parents. They're kind of inspired by my husband and I. He was an ex theater guy, and I'm a writer, and um, and so she has this very creative, creative background, and yet she's kind of not into it. And one day, her mom comes home with this teenage boy, and he seems very familiar, and he starts. Um, kind of uh, asking her questions like, did you make the honor roll? And all these very personal questions, and she realizes that this this 13 or 14 year old boy is actually her grandfather, and he is a scientist, and he figured out a way to reverse aging. That's how the book starts. So it's really the book is really about, you know, the consequences of what would happen in society if we we were be able were able to reverse aging. Yeah, and and the beauty is that it's this tension and struggle between. Uh, this relationship that's been turned on its head through the grandfather now becoming almost like a son character but still wanting to parent the mom and the mom's trying to deal with the daughter. And the daughter, in a sense, almost feels like she's trying to parent them both through this whole kind of um, tension and, and, and trying to find his way, the grandfather finds his way back. I, I loved it. I, I loved the characters. Um, and uh, one of the, the things that I loved about it is that you draw in things like the crispy corn dog, and you build the piece into the characters themselves. Where do you? How do you do that? How, I mean, how does an author go about building in these quirks? Is it just purely from 
your experience, or, or are you creating all of that, or is it a, a mix of both of those? I mean, I think for me it was a mix of both. Some of the, I feel like a lot of what authors do is we kind of, um, or I am, we're kind of boring. We sit around and watch li life. I feel like instead of, I'd rather watch people than TV sometimes just to see what's going on. But also I think you, you have to start to remember and mind your own experiences, like the grandfather, um, his wife had died, so Ellie's grandmother had died many years before, but he always kept her slippers under the bed, and I've kind of noticed that in grandparents of, of my own grandfather when my grandmother died, the things that he kept from her were not necessarily like the mementos you would think that they would keep, you know, like the big gold ring, not, that didn't mean as much to him as something like a little mason jar that he had, so that, that was more personal to him, so. Hey, Jennifer. Uh, Go ahead. Can you talk yeah, we're getting some uh, delay there. Hey, Jennifer, can you talk to the teachers in our audience? You, uh, not too long ago, were a kid yourself, and uh, I mean, you were interested in writing, uh, I assume, as a kid, or maybe you weren't. Uh, what would you say to teachers in terms of them fostering future authors and authoring uh, passions in kids uh, today? What, what did your teachers do well, and what, what do you wish they would have done a little bit differently? You know, I was lucky. I had great teachers. One of my most memorable teachers was my second grade teacher who read aloud to us. And that was why it was pretty amazing to be part of the global read aloud. She read aloud the boxcar children. And like to this day, I can remember what it was like sitting in that classroom and what it smelled like and the sun coming through the window. But I think one thing that I've noticed today with um, students today and even with my own kids, I'm a mom and I have two kids, and a 7-year-old and an 11-year-old, is that the kids are very nervous about like being perfect right out the gate about everything. Like they want the first time they draw something, they want it to be beautiful. They want their first paragraph to be perfect. And so I feel like they become sort of paralyzed with fear. And that's what is preventing them from putting their pen to the paper and writing a sentence or being creative. And one thing that I find sometimes works is just to tell them to doodle. Take a pad, doodle out your idea. I doodle out my ideas for books sometimes, like just draw little cartoons on the page, like a, a page of doodle ideas, and it's not as threatening. It start, lets me to start to think about um, like what I'm going to do eventually. So sometimes I feel like there's a big visual literacy component to just literacy in general to, to writing. So that, That's awesome. I, mean, I think that's, I'm going to use that next week. Um, <laughs> So thanks for that. Uh, now, there's a big theme of science kind of running through the book. Are, are you, do you have a science background, or is that something that you had to go do research to be able to draw within and place with inside your book? Yeah, I did some research, but I came from a science family. So um, my dad was a doctor, my, my mother was a nurse, and so that whole bit in the book about um, Melvin keeping petri dishes in the refrigerator. Our, when, I, when we were growing up, our dad kept petri dishes with blood auger in our refrigerator to culture bacteria. <laughs> like that was normal. We didn't realize it wasn't normal until we grew up and like went to college and then came home and said, that was pretty weird, actually. <laughs> so yeah, my dad was a very sciencey guy and um, he was a much older father, but he loved salt and so I fell in love with salt too and, and it's I think we forget now what how polio had been such a a horrible epidemic that affected, you know, just 60 years ago, really, maybe 70 years ago, and children everywhere, and how that really changed the world at that moment, and that Salk and Oppenheimer were like these rock star scientists. I mean, they were like the Bill Gates of the day. So, Very cool. And um, we, we're running out of time quickly here, but I did want to touch on uh, a, a, someone who's a friend of yours, Colby Sharp, and... They got the people that are putting together like the nerdy book clubs and all those things. I know there's a big event coming up, and I didn't want to end the show without getting a chance to have you talk about that. So could you talk about that? Yes, absolutely. So Nerdy Book Club is the coolest group of educators, teachers, librarians, book lovers, authors, readers, and there's going to be an amazing um, meetup this summer. It's called Nerd Camp, and it's going to be in Michigan in early July. So be there. I'm gone. I can't wait. I already, my ticket is booked, actually. So That's awesome. Uh, well, thank <laughs> you so much for 
Jennifer, uh, it's quite a privilege to have you on the show, and uh, uh, I, I know that uh, your life has probably gotten pretty exciting now that you're uh, the author of this book and uh, a Newberry Honor uh, Award winner and everything like that. So we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Hey, yeah. before we go, I uh, just want to remind our audience about Global School Play Day. You can go to globalschoolplayday.com to learn more, and that's coming up the first Wednesday in February. Uh, just a chance for us to declare the importance of play with our kids and uh, raise awareness about that. So uh, ho hopefully we'll get you involved. And, and uh, thank you so much again, and thanks for watching, Mom and Dad. Thanks for watching, Mom and Dad. Bye. Ha, ha, ha.